Good evening, everyone. My name is Alana Rabinovich, and I am thrilled to be here to introduce you to our very last master panel of the season. Tonight, we, rep we present Beyond Words, The Art of Translation, and we'll feature five incredibly accomplished linguists and writers. First, I'd like to acknowledge that the land we are meeting on is a traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. We also acknowledge that in Toronto, we are covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Our host this evening is the charming and very talented Eric Dupont a 2018 Giller Prize shortlister for his, his book, Songs of the Cold of Heart, Songs for the Cold of Heart, my apologies, incidentally translated by another panelist tonight, Peter McCambridge. Also joining us is Katya Grubasik, Rhonda Mullins, and Susan Uyu. Welcome to you all. Eric will give brief bio information on each of the participants and get tonight's conversation underway. To all the viewers out there, please take advantage of the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Eric will take as many questions as he can, starting at around 7.45. So without further ado, Eric, please take it away. Thank you very much, Alana. Uh, welcome everybody to, uh, to, this, uh, to this talk. I would like to uh, introduce our panelists before we start. Um, first of all, we have uh, Susan Uryu, uh, who is an award-winning translator whose latest award was the 2009 Governor General's Award for Literary Translation. She has translated novels by Quebecois, Spanish, and Mexican authors, has taught, has taught translation at the University of Calgary, helped to create and edit a biannual national trans translation anthology, Translit, and is the editor of the 2010 anthology of BILTC translators writing on translation, Beyond Words, Translating the World. She is also an award-winning fiction writer and has written a novel, Damselfish, and numerous short stories. She is a former director of the Banff International Literary Translation Center, and she currently lives in Calgary. We then have uh, Rhonda Mullins. Hi, Rhonda. Hello. Rhonda is a Montreal-based translator who has translated many books from French into English, including Jocelyne Saussier's um, and Miles to Go, Before I Sleep, Grégoire Courtois' The Laws of the Skies, Dominique Fortier's Paper Houses, and Anaïs Barbeau-Lavalette's Suzanne. She is a seven-time finalist for the Governor General's Literary Award for Translation, winning the award in 2015 for her translation of Jocelyne Saussier's 21 Cardinals. Novels she has translated were contenders for CBC Canada Reads in 2015 and 2019, and one was a finalist for the 2018 Best Translated Book Award. Peter McCambridge. Hi, Peter. I am. Uh, originally is from Ireland. Uh, Peter uh, holds a BA in Modern Languages from Cambridge University, England, and has lived in Quebec City since 2003. He runs Quebec Reads and, Q and QC Fiction. His translations have been World Literature Today's Notable Translations, longlisted for Canada Reads and finalists for the Scotiabank Giller Prize and the Governor General's Award for Translation. And uh, last but not least, uh, Katya Grubisik, uh, hello Katya, is a writer, editor, and translator. She has been a finalist for the A.M. Klein Prize for Poetry and her collection of poems, What If Red, Can, what if Red Ran Out, won the Gérard Lampère Award for the Best First Book. Her translations into English include works by Marie-Claire Blais, Nicole Brossard, David Clerson, Martine Delvaux, and Stéphane Martelly. And uh, I am Eric Dupont, as uh, Elana has introduced me. I was born in the Gaspé, Quebec. Um, I, had, I live in Montreal. I am a um, faculty lecturer at McGill University in translation. Um, 
my fourth novel, La Fiancée Américaine, released in 2012, uh, won the Prix des Libraires du Québec and the Prix Littéraire des Collégiens. The English translation, Songs for the Cold of Heart by Peter McCambridge, was shortlisted for the Scotiabank Giller Prize in 2018 and subsequently published by HarperCollins USA under the title The American Fiancé. Uh, so welcome to all to this, uh, to this fascinating talk that uh, we have tonight with our guests. And uh, I would like to get the conversation started because I'm very eager to hear all of our participants. They are, um, how would you call them? They are superstars of the, uh, the very small world of translation in Canada, uh, of literary translation, I mean by that. And uh, so we'll have this discussion with them. We'd like to ask them about their art, about what, um, how they approach translation, what they think, um, uh, their attitude when they, they approach translation. And at the end of the talk, if we have time, I would like to share with you um, a fascinating exercise that um, I thought would be interesting to uh, launch tonight. Uh, I sent all of our participants a 90 word, uh, or it was a 100 word uh, excerpt of a novel, uh, of a Quebec novel that has not been translated yet. And each of them sent me their translation of it. And uh, maybe if we have time at the, the end of our talk, we can uh, look at their translations and, and, uh, and see for ourselves that translation really is an art. Um, I would like to start with uh, the first topic that I would like to talk about with our guests is the notion of uh, empathy. Um, the reason why I talk about empathy is because I wrote to all of them before the talk and they, they, we, we sort of had conversations going and the, the notion of empathy um, in translation uh, came up quite a few times in these conversations. And I would like to ask uh, Rhonda and afterwards all of our panelists, um, you said Rhonda that um, you have been thinking a lot lately about empathy in your translations. Why is empathy important in translation and why is it important for you? Well, I hope I can make some sense of this for you because it's, it's still a pretty elusive idea um, that I've got uh, rolling around in my brain. But at some point after I translated a bunch of different authors with a bunch of different voices, I started to wonder sort of what the thread is going through um, all of those. And, you know, there, there's something at work that's sort of an alchemy that is well beyond the mechanics of the translation. Um, and it, 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 it just started to feel to me like one of the, the ingredients in that al alchemy is empathy, which can play itself out in a bunch of different ways, or even more broadly, you know, the sort of psychological makeup of, of the translator. Um, because I find I'm a, a sponge uh, for other people's emotions, which I think a lot of us are to greater or lesser degrees. And uh, that can be, you know, uh, a burden, um, but it can, it, can, it, it can be a burden in real life and it can be a real boon in translation because, um, you know, I eventually started to see that this is part of my psychological makeup. And since it is part of my psychological makeup, you know, it's, it's nice to be able to put it to good use. Um, so I learned that I, 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 I translated uh, a couple of sort of dis more disturbing novels and I realized in that process that I can translate um, things that I can't read. Like I can't read books with too much pain or too much loss or too much violence or I, I just end up sort of carrying with me what I've taken off the page and I can carry it with me for a week like it will actually sort of change my mood for, for quite a long time. So I started to wonder, well, why can I translate things that I can't read? And I think that the reason is, is that when I, uh, in the act of translation, you know, you're sort of taking what the author has given you on the page, uh, the pain and the loss and, and, and whatever is sort of underlying that in, in their own life, you do the translation and you put it out on the page and it's kind of, it's a form of processing it for me. So it doesn't stay stuck inside me the way that sometimes books or movies or whatever can. It comes back out. And hopefully in that kind of moving through me process, some of the emotion of the author comes through as well. And, and, I, and I think that that's the kind of thing that will make a more 
beautiful translation, you know, beyond uh, beyond the the mechanics and the right rhythm and the right word choice and things like that. So it's kind of this this this, um, this indefinable subtle process by which you connect to an author. I see. I see. Thank you. It, do you are you capable of feeling empathy for every text that uh, your publishers send you to translate? Um, I think that I'll have a, a very strong reaction if I can't translate something for whatever reason that I might not necessarily know. So I think it's quite immediately obvious to me whether I can kind of get in there and, and touch what I need to touch to be able to translate. And I had done um, this uh, quite a, a violent uh, book, uh, a brilliant book by Grégoire Courtois called Laws of the Skies. And I'm not giving anything away because he divulges this on the first page of the novel, but in it, uh, you know, 12 young children die um, violently, unpleasantly. And after I had done this, you know, so people had identified me with it, even though I'm not the author, and they were wondering, well, how could you have translated such a thing? Like, it's just so horrible. And, and I realized what the process was that, that Grégoire, in, in every death scene, he, he got up very close with the child. There was no objectification, though. It was almost like he was holding their hands um, as, they, as they died and got very into this, or, you know, the, the, the chemical processes that might be going on in such a situation, what a child might understand from it. And so I just kind of followed his lead and got right in there as if you were helping someone through a very difficult moment. And that's what made me able to translate, you know, frankly, you know, some pretty horrific scenes because there was this sense, not just of empathy with the fictional child, but empathy with what Grégoire had done. And so I just kind of stayed in step with him and it worked. I see, I see. Can I say something about Eric? Because I think it's Please. interesting, Please. Rhonda, Please. the way you're talking about your solution when it gets too gruesome and too real isn't the step back, but it's the step in and the, to show more empathy rather than remove yourself from the process and say, I'm just translating words on the page, but to really get into it and be with the author. I have a hard time stepping back and, I, and I, I'm lucky to uh, be able to leave that to editors because <laughs> I can't, you know, it just becomes. Mm. And at some point I, I wonder with what, you know, as I practice sort of setting boundaries in my own life, I get afraid that I will set too many boundaries for the translation and my work will suffer, so. Thank you very much, uh, Rhonda. Uh, has empathy helped you make better decisions when translating? That's a, that's a question that, um, th does, does empathy uh, help you find the, what you call the mot juste, the right word, you know? Or See, and that, that's the part, that's the part that's hard for me to put my finger on because I sort of uh, end up not in a very thinky place when I'm translating. Uh, it's in a very, very feely place. And that's why I rely so much on editors because if I get carried away somehow, they'll rein me back in. And so I just let it, let it happen. I've learned not to, I mean, I do edit myself, of course, I revise and revise and revise, but uh, when I'm in doubt, I just let it in there and, and I know that the editors got it. And I've never been let down once where they didn't you know, sort of spot something that, that shouldn't be there. Okay. Um, thank you very much uh, for uh, these thoughts on empathy. I had never considered the notion uh, of empathy in translation. It's, it's kind of a revelation for me um, uh, tonight um, because as a writer, we used empathy for our characters. For, 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 but I had never applied it to the, uh, the, the, the notion of translation, uh, which brings me to another conversation I had with one of our translators tonight. Uh, Suzanne, uh, when I asked you to give me a sort of a take home of your approach to translation, you answered that you always strive to go beyond words and look for the intended meaning, what they call le vouloir dire in a text. In other terms, you are trying to detach yourself from the original words. How do you achieve this detachment and why do you want to get away from words? Aren't you a translator that uses words? If you run away from them, aren't you sort of uh, saying no to your tools? 
Um, oh, I definitely use words as my tools, but I do have to get away from the French words. I have to get away. So I, I call it, it's, um, it's looking for the notional and emotional effects. So the notional is all the ideas, all the images that the original author is conjuring. And then the uh, emotional effect is, of course, what I'm feeling and what the author wants the, uh, the reader to to feel. I also think that also that helps me because any literary text has a subtext, something that isn't written. And as a translator, you're translating, you have, you have breathed in that subtext, you understand what lies under the words. And I have in, you know, in being a judge and different, I've seen places where the translators haven't seen the subtext and all the words are there. And it just, I, I remember one, it was a short story by a great Quebec author. And I read the translation. I, I read the translation first. I thought, oh, this doesn't sound like something but by, by that author. Went back to the original and that's it is when you hear, when you see, when you feel the subtext, then it comes out in your own translation. But once again, you're not making it explicit, but because you have, and you know, I love Rhonda's word empathy because I've never thought of it like that, but it is empathy is you are feeling what these characters, you are also feeling what the author was feeling as the author put it on the page. And as, because I write as well, I find I have to go to a place as a writer too without words, you know? Like going through life is, <laughs> it's pretty incomprehensible sometime. And trying to get it down on the page, you go out and you try to capture those feelings somehow within the words that your language gives you. And in French, they're not the same words. In English, they're not the same words. The poetry isn't the same. You have to, you have to get away from that original in, in order to be true to it in translation. Yes. And uh, after you've gotten away from the French words that you want to translate into English, what would you call the step? You, you've gotten away from the French words. You see the scenes. You understand what's going on. Yet you don't have words yet to, to express it in English. How would you describe or call the step that follows the realization that you understand the effect of, <laughs> and that you want to recreate it? Is, um, is, yeah, well, it's, I mean, it's a fairly technical way, just reformulation. So uh -huh. you reformulate, but I, I don't, yeah, I just, it, with my English, I want to be able to evoke the same images and the same feelings and how I go about it, I never know. Like I, I fall in love with the original and then I, I don't know how I'm going to do it, but the same as Rhonda, if I, if I get that feeling from it, I know that I will eventually. Uh, thank you. Uh, Peter, can you tell me if there's a way for you to, I would say, quote, induce, unquote, empathy with the author that you are translating. Is there something you can do to, uh, d d d d first of all, or do you agree with this idea of empathy that, that we've been discussing? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I'm glad you said that because that's exactly what I was thinking before you asked the question. It was, I think it's easier to do this, just put yourself in the author's shoes, to be there with the author when you care about the author and when you care about the text. And when you really get the text and when the French text moves you emotionally and you're not a hand for hire, you know, you're not translating something for 18 cents a word thinking this is badly written, this is never going to sell, this is rubbish, I don't like this, which happens, not to me, but it happens, you know, <laughs> but uh, I think it happens when you're translating a book that you really care about and it made you cry at some stage and that you want to succeed. And for me, the golden, well, for me, my starting point for any translation is I try, and I think it should be said too, that this applies to whether you're translating a press release or whether you're translating a government report or whether you're translating an award-winning novel. Like, I think if you're invested in translation, everything we've said so far applies to translation and not just to literary translation. Like, I think a good translator won't just translate the words that are on the page when he's translating a badly written government press release but he'll try and bring the meaning across too and he'll reformulate just as much as we reformulate when we're translating author's words. And if anything, sometimes our job is easier than when you're translating a badly written government report 
because nine times out of 10, our work is beautifully written and it's, it says exactly what it wants to say and it works emotionally and it works on all levels. So for me, I try and say, if I'm translating Eric Dupont, I try and say, what would he have said if he'd said this in English? And then my golden rule is you want the translation to work. I so see. that entails varying degrees of faithfulness or stepping away from the text or empathy or moving in with the author. But at the end of the day, you want a text in English that just works. And for me, that's a collaboration between me and the author and the revisers and readers all throughout the process. And at the end of the day, that's where the magic happens. That's where something just works in English that's hard to put your finger on. But I think it's easier to get there when everyone's invested in the text and cares about the text and puts the extra 10% in. And yeah. You said a big word, you said a word that has little stars around it in the world of translation. You said the word faithfulness, <laughs> uh, Peter. What is faithfulness for you, Peter McCambridge? <laughs> I think you need to be faithful to the author's intentions. Like Susan said, you're not so much faithful to the words on the page, you're faithful to what the author was trying to do with the words. I see. And faithful to the effect the author created. So when I'm translating you, for example, there's loads of jokes there's loads of religious context about nuns in Quebec. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we rework the jokes. You know, we try and find a different pun or we put a pun in some place on some page where there wasn't one because we couldn't, we couldn't translate a pun that was earlier in the book. But yeah. for, that's much easier because I can work with you in the text. And we're both pulling in the same direction and we both want the same thing, which is a text that works. I see. Thank you. Um, I would like to talk about um, the others now. I mean, by the others, I, for a lot of people, uh, I get asked, for example, from people who uh, do not know much about the, the world of translation, why I don't translate my own books into English and the other languages I speak. Do you get asked that, Rhonda? You're laughing. No, I just know that uh, that authors who are uh, capable in many languages get that question a lot. And yeah. um, yeah, and I try to avoid it at dinner parties. <laughs> I know, I know. But this question makes me think that, you know, you need a translator, but you need a whole bunch of other people. Those are the people I call the others, the people who are involved in the translation process, the revisers, the proofreaders, the publishers, etc. The translator is not alone. It's not a story where you have author, translator, bookstore. It's, it's not like that. Uh, Katya, you mentioned the importance, uh, when I, I talked to you, you mentioned the importance of proofreaders and revisers in translation. You seem to have, you seem to, to have uh, a lot to say about them, about the importance of proofreaders, revisers. Would you like to expand on that, please? Well, I think I have lots, thank you. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a good question. I think it's also, um, uh, I think the empathy extends to everyone else who's involved as well, ideally. Um, and one thing that worries me about the direction that the book industry sometimes seems to be going into is that it's becoming more fragmented in terms of of how we contract out that empathy, basically, and you know how and what what uh, what ramifications that has on the the art form and on the product. Um, but certainly, I speak from a position. I think I have a lot to say because I've been extensively edited, and I love being edited. And I work as an editor as well, um, and I have been also not edited at all. Sometimes I think with some publishers, and it's a question of, you know, a thousand things, a question of funding or lack of funding, it's a question of lack of resources, of timelines, of whatever. Um, but definitely there's a sense sometimes that the book already exists. Presumably it's already perfect. It exists in its perfect form in the original language, in the source language. And so the only thing you need to do is render that into the target language, as if there's not, you know, 18 levels of interaction that have to happen for all, like for all the reasons my, that my colleagues here have said for the, you know, the jokes that have to be completely recultured um, for all of those levels of distance that have to be that, that accordioning out that Susan was referring to. Um, how can we get back to something as you know that, that we need to be far away from in order to see it more clearly uh, the empathy that Rhonda evokes. And so I think that I mean uh, to use. You know, Peter is a good example. So, so QC Fiction um, is publishing my second translation of David Casson, um, his, his short fiction, I did his novel the first time. And it's very rare to have, I think there were like four people involved after my, I think I had like 11 drafts or whatever ridiculous, and five drafts of each short story and then a bunch of drafts of the whole thing. And then I think there were three or four people after you, Peter, um, 
And these are people who will say, you know, it's a various degrees. They'll say, is this what David sounds like in English? Is this what David would, you know, would sound like in English? It's basically good. And the book, of course, stops with the translator because you can say, mm, no, he wouldn't say that for reasons that are sometimes hard to put your finger on. Um, and sometimes when you have the writer at hand, the writer can say, yes, I have a fascination with shrews. Yes, I put them in at toutes les sauces, you know, or whatever the thing might be. Or if you don't have the writer at hand, then again, it's the translator's call, I think. But it's such a privilege to have that level of close reading on a work that gets better and better every time. And yet I guarantee you, I mean, when I saw the, the last proof, I think I still had like, <laughs> I was begging Peter to make changes at the 11th hour before going to the printers, right? And so and there were two actual typos in there, which is, which is, you know, so for reasons of just practical quality, like, you know, you don't want something to be, you don't want um, the word public to be missing its L or whatnot. But also just for the reasons of, I find, I don't know if, I, if the rest of you can speak to this maybe, but the more languages you speak, the more each language makes sense to itself in its own language. And sometimes I write um, something in English and I'm like, well, I think that's English. Is that English? Is that French? Is that something like, you know, where because to me it makes sense. And in, 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 even in my day-to-day -day life in my household, we speak in a number of languages. And so you forget what the boundaries of your language are, I think. And so for someone else to say like, I don't think that's actually, that doesn't work in English. You know, Rhonda, you were saying this a little bit as well. When you get to that point, someone has to call you on your, on your perhaps uh, emotional excesses but also on your just like ridiculous linguistic missteps, because of course it makes sense to you. You see it in both, you live it in both, right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, you also mentioned something to the effect that the practices in revision and proofreading, um, this, may be, uh, this may be your own personal experience, but it, uh, you seem to, to suggest that they're not the same in the French, uh, on the French side or the French publishing side uh, in Canada and in the English on the English speaking side, have you observed differences in practices? I mean, I speak from a position of having published in English and having connections uh, only tangentially with French publishers. I think it depends very much on the author. There are some authors who write and then they're completely hands off and they just send the manuscript in and off it goes. Um, but yeah, in my experience in Quebec, there's, uh, there's occasionally a sense that, um, I don't know, I don't, I don't know if I, I'm going to make 8,000 enemies saying this, I think, but sometimes I wonder if. Um, there's a sense of some, some writers seem more prolific than they are, um, than they're up punctilious, let's put it that way. More prolific than that? Than what? More prolific, more prolific than they are punctilious. Like, I mean, I think that some people are, they, you know, they write a lot and the books have to be published. They have to come out and the attention, I feel like, I, this goes back to the book industry too, the attention span for books is so sadly short that I think sometimes you feel like you're having to produce another book, another translation every couple of years, every, you know, every five years or whatever. Um, whereas and maybe this just speaks also my way of working, but you know, you could work on one book in one sentence for probably 10 years and still be putting in commas and taking out commas. So there's obviously a point also at which you have to just, you know, get off the pot. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. <laughs> well, let's just do that. Let's go, let's go down to the level of the comma with you guys, because I think that uh, maybe we have time to uh, see how Everything that you said now is played out, uh, not everything, of course. I will share my screen and show the short excerpt that I sent you uh, to all of you because I had the luxury of having uh, four people, four star translators who, who all translate from French into English, Spanish, and what, what, the, all, the target language of, for all four of you is English, which is a luxury that we seldom have in uh, on panels about translation. So let me share my screen. And uh, where did I put this? Okay. There we go. There we are. So this is a new novel by an author called uh, Paul Serge Forêt. The novel is set on the um, on the North Shore of Quebec, the lower North Shore, close to Cécile, uh, up in the north. Uh, the um, uh, it's, it's it's a very remote uh, area, and uh, it's about uh, Peter. Would you agree to say that it's about a family that owns a a seafood uh, empire or seafood factory? I was just hoping you weren't going to ask me to say what it was about. God, it's complicated what it's about. It's crazy. It's really a mad, mad, brilliant novel. 
Okay. It's about a family and a strange Japanese man comes to the village, the man who comes. And it's about that and an invention of a color, a new color that will change the world. Okay. Well, the first 90 words do not say that at all. You know, let's, <laughs> let's go through that. <laughs> What, that's the importance of reading the whole book before you translate the first the first word. Let's look at this. Uh, I'll read it in French. Lori le large réagit. C'était entre la Pentecôte et la Trinité, entre la rivière Pentecôte et la rivière de la Trinité. Chaque année, quelquefois, pendant la semaine qu'elle durait, Rogatien le large reprenait conscience de cette coïncidence spatio-temporelle s'en étonnait assez pour qu que ça le fasse sourire tout seul et la gardait pour lui. Les deux fêtes ne sont pas très loin l'une de l'autre dans le calendrier liturgique, comme les deux rivières sur la route 138. Les noms des choses, en était-il venu à se dire, sont comme de vieilles blagues semées par nos ancêtres pour nous parler d'une réalité, nous inviter à la connivence. On peut les poigner ou non How? Okay, so I have four uh, submissions that are all very different. Uh, the first one goes uh, like this. Would you like to read it? Maybe uh, 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 the first one. Would you like to read? Can you see it, uh, Susan? Pardon me. Yeah, I can see it. Would you Would you like to read the first? Uh, the first one. Yeah, please. Okay. Laurie Le Bas Le Large re reacts. It was between Pentecost and Trinity, between Rivière Pentecôte and Rivière de la Trinité. Every year, for the week it lasted, Rogatien Le Large would occasionally think about this coincidence of space and time, sufficiently surprised that he couldn't help but smile and keep it to himself. The two celebrations fall close together on the liturgical calendar, like the two rivers along Route 138. 138. He had come to think of the names of things as old jokes sown by our ancestors who want to let us in on their reality. Whether or not we get the jokes is up to us. Susan, have they ever asked you to do audiobooks for Audible? I would listen to you for 20 hours. <laughs> <laughs> Now that's something I've never heard. <laughs> Thank yes. you very much. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So we have this first. Uh, everybody can see the first. Uh, the first uh, proposition. The first suggestion. And uh, I. The colors. Uh, I, I put colors just to see how each translator has treated certain elements differently for uh, the viewers to see. If they and you can of course of course ask questions about that. Uh, 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 the viewers can ask questions, and we'll get to the questions in a few minutes. Thank you very much. Do you think um, I will read the second one? Um, it was some time between Pentecost and Trinity Sunday, some place between the Pentecost and Trinity rivers. Every, every year, once or twice during the week it lasted, Rogatien Le Large would remark the coincidence of time and space, raise enough of an eyebrow for it to draw a smile and keep it to himself. The two holidays aren't far apart on the liturgical calendar, and the same goes for the two rivers on route 138. This time, route with a capital letter. The names of things, we notice these things. It's the first, it jumps in our face. What, why is there a capital letter? Uh, the names of things he had come to think are like old jokes and headed down by our ancestors, letting us in on a whole other world. You either get them or you don't. And that's a, uh, a different one. It has a, a different feel to it. Um, I don't know how I would describe it. Um, it's uh, the, the uh, for example, the element in green, whether or not we get the jokes is up to us. This time in uh, number two, you either get them or you don't. But the differences get even, uh, I think, more interesting. Would you like to read uh, the excerpt number three, please, uh, Katia? Sure. L Lori Lelage asked out. It would happen between the Sundays of Pentecost and Trinity and between the rivers Pentecost and Trinity. Occasionally, during that particular week every year, Rogatien Le Large found himself struck anew by the spatiotemporal coincidence of it all, enough to make him smile, yet keep it to himself. The two holy days are not that far apart in the liturgical calendar, and neither are the two rivers along Route 138. He'd come to the conclusion that the names of things are like old jokes sown by our ancestors to tell of a certain reality and to let us in on the moment. You either get them or you don't. Yes. And if this were, um, if this were a translation course, we would go on for about a half an hour uh, 
on the, um, the the decision for translation number three to use the word sown, the verb sown by our ancestors, uh, for translation number one to translation number one to use the word sown, and translation number two chose handed down or um, yeah handed down by our ancestors. We would discuss that. That's something that is of course also very interesting. And uh, uh, the 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 last one, uh, Rhonda, would you like to read it for us, please? I can't I can't see all of it because the way my screen is set up, and I'm afraid that if I click something, I'm going to right. um, disappear. Um, this would have been yeah. between the week. This would have been the week between Pentecost and Trinity Sunday, and in between Pentecost and Trinity Rivers. Every year, several times over the course of those days, Agassien Le Large would note the alignment of time and space. It always surprised him a little, or enough that he smiled to himself and said nothing. The two feast days aren't so far apart in the liturgical calendar. Like those two rivers along the 138 this time. I don't know if you've noticed that they all use root, root, and root, except for this one along the 138. The names of things Rogacien had come to think are old jokes planted by our ancestors to teach us some truth, invite us to be in and on it, and either we get it or we don't. I would like to, uh, to stress the fact that I actually forgot who wrote what. I, I, I received them, uh, copied and pasted them, but there's one thing could the big question here would be would i be able to recognize peter's work or ronda's work or susan's work if i read their translations and all that's one interesting question that we could ask and there's something susan that you said when uh, you sent me you sent in your um you sent me an email with uh, an attachment with your translation you said um you deplored or you lamented the fact that you hadn't had time to read the whole book, of course, that it seemed interesting. Um, would that have changed your approach to it a lot, your approach to the excerpt? Well, I'm, I actually, I've organized a few translation slams. And whenever I do, I try to have it either be a piece of very short fiction or an essay. So it is a whole, because everything in the book, I think Peter mentioned it early on, informs everything else. So here I find there are so many questions raised by this text. I mean, even the title, well, the Laurie Le Large is never even mentioned. So we have no idea what the, the connection is. So. I find when it's a text out of context, it's to me, it's more of a language lesson. Uh, and, and it's more about then, because there, there are just too many things uh, under the surface here that um, we can't know how to translate because we don't know the story. Even, you know, going and looking at the summary of what the story is, the, it, it just can't inform you enough, I don't think. No, it cannot. And basically, it's it's a it's a fun game to see um, to to kind of show to to make a point about translation being a form of art, uh, about translation coming out differently with each translators. And and um, but as you are right, if we were to translate or to read the the whole book, we would probably go back and change a few things in these lines, eh? For sure. For sure. Yeah. Even even the fact I think that it's the opening of the whole novel um, for me changed. I think I must have gone through you know seven different permutations of those first four or five words, which of course then have echoes throughout the rest of the translation because you don't want to repeat words and because you don't want to have you know awkward patterns and can you be between and between. Um, I think if it weren't if it were just a piece a paragraph listed from the middle of a chapter, you wouldn't have those concerns. But the fact is that you want to grab your author, you want to grab your reader rather. Um, you know, really by the by the eyeballs and then by the heart and by the brain, everything with those first few words and set the tone for the storytelling. So it's not, whereas in French, tete is sort of enunciatory, yeah. right? And so in English, I think, I'm, I, I think I had like seven different uh, attempts at that first, just those first four or five words. Yeah, and I, of course, as a translation uh, uh, professor or translation teacher, uh, the, 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 the first thing that you see is, okay, the, Number one and two starts with it was, and number three and four, it would, you know, and that, that already sets uh, 
you know, uh, that it changes a, a bit of the sense. Although, I mean, we could, um, there was Route 38 that I found uh, extremely interesting. Suddenly there's an eyebrow that appeared. There was no eyebrow in French here, but there's an eyebrow that appeared in English, an eyebrow that makes the characters smile. Um, and in other translations in, in blue, it was sufficiently surprised. Uh, I mean, there's, we you only translated ninety words, and uh, and suddenly we have uh, we have uh, hours to talk about uh, here. I will stop sharing my screen now. Good, just warning people. And uh, I would like to uh, to invite our viewers to ask questions to our panelists. You can. Um, uh, uh, Ask questions. We already received the questions at, um, at 6:48 before we started, and there was only there's already one very interesting question that I would like to uh, submit to our panelists. Um, hi, I'm functionally bilingual, and I'm very aware that when I speak my second language, that I am still constructing my communication like an anglophone. I just say or write things in a way that no francophone would ever do. Can you describe a translation project when you had the challenge of translating something that just wouldn't work in the language you were translating into? What was the challenge and how did you deal with it? Can we start with uh, anyone wants to jump in on this one? I have. I always have a difficult time remembering any examples because it just all, I don't know, it all empties out of my brain the minute I'm done. And in fact, I find that translators who remember things, they just become encyclopedic in their knowledge. And I am unfortunately a sieve, so it doesn't work. But I do remember there was in a Jocelyn Saussier book um, there, the, that, uh, was that was very, very popular and turned into a movie, uh, des Oiseaux and the Birds Rain Down in English. And in it was it was about these old hermits um, who went into the woods to, to sort of live out their life with freedom and one of them dies <clears throat> and when they're trying to explain how he died I, I think in French it was like il est mort de sa mort like he just he just died you know and um, and so this was one of my earlier uh, attempts and what I sent to the editor naively was you know he died of his death which just doesn't it's just really ugly um, and so we had to go round and round and round. And then eventually what we came up with was he, he just reached his expiry date. Um, so it was really, you had to do a big shift because it worked beautifully in the French and it was so terrible in English. So we eventually <laughs> came up with that. Was it something like, il est mort de sa belle mort? Is it something like that? It, no, it was... It was literally, I think, il est mort, il était mort, il est mort de sa mort. It was very, very simple. And, yeah. Killed by death. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I, I have an example from a, a title, and titles can often be problematic because you're not, not everything is necessarily fitting into it. But I, I translated Chercher le vent de Guillaume Vignon. Oh, yeah. And so I kept trying to, and I didn't like any of them. And then I thought, I'm just, going to think about this whole novel that I've translated and what for me that it the title would what it's about and so I wrote to Guillaume and I said what would you think if I called it necessary betrayals and he said you won't believe this but up until two weeks before it was published it was called trahison nécessaire <laughs> so which has nothing to do with chercher le vent <laughs> oh. well you said that titles can be a problem tell me about it uh, Peter, do you agree that titles can be problematic to translate? Yeah, but I have basically the same story. Like when we wanted to translate La Fiancée Américaine, I said, to, well, for different reasons, I didn't like, I didn't think the title worked as well in English as it did in French. So I thought in French, it's an outward looking title that appeal, that places the book within like a North American context and outside of Quebec. And I thought for the translation, well, the translation already belongs to that world. So we don't need to appeal to it and position ourselves within it. We want to appeal to a different sensibility. So I said to Eric, what do you think about Songs for the Cold of Heart, which is a line that comes up four or five times in the novel. And he said to me, that was, one of, that was what I wanted it to be called in French. <laughs> so when that happens, you're happy and you just, <laughs> and you go with it, you know, and actually, as an aside, for most of our titles, for nearly all of our titles with QC Fiction, we try and find, we put a lot of effort into finding a title that we think works really well in English as well. 
And mm. sometimes that's just down to something like we thought the French title was too generic. And if you look on Goodreads, there's already 12 books in English with that same title if you just translate it word for word. But yeah. for nearly for nearly all of them, like including Bestiaire, the first book I translated uh, by Eric, uh, that, that's Faithfulness again. I very faithfully translated that as that Life in the Court of Matan. So. You see, this is one thing about translation. When you write a novel, it's out there. And somebody said that earlier. It's out there. You can't change it. But you, you can have a second, third, or fourth translation. That's a luxury that the author does not have. You see, to go, go back on the words. Um, there's a very interesting question here by uh, Bronwyn Averett. Uh, so nice to see you all for this interesting conversation. I would love to know more about your thoughts and how comfortable you are bringing your own voice and own style into the translation. As Eric said, giving the work a feeling that it's a, that it's by a particular translator. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, do you make a do you make an effort to intervene to leave traces so that you can be traced, or is it something that happens? Or Katya, what do you think of it? No, I actually do that more to go back to what Peter was saying about the the more breadwinning translations we do, government documents and that kind of thing. I tend to do that. I tend to try to have more fun in those when I can, um, you know, just to try to amuse myself in what's otherwise a rather dreary task. But I think in literary translation, I think you, on the one hand, you can't help it. Um, and then the, this, I think the flip side of empathy, maybe or the, the kind of companion of empathy would be humility, um, not a kind of false modesty, but I think that I try to translate as a reader. I think when you, you, know, you read a book and you're so involved in it that you feel like you're talking to the characters as you're doing your dishes, they inhabit your world. You, sort of, you, you start thinking like them, you start, their, their rhythm becomes yours in a way, you know, in the way that sometimes you find an author and you want to read everything they've written or you get to the end and you're mourning the end because the characters are done, they're gone and then the, the book is done. And so I think that same absorption happens when you're translating ideally, when you find that sense of real affinity with the writer that you're trans whose work you're translating. Um, and I think when that happens, you can't, on the one hand, you can't help but be present because you have stepped so far into their words, into their work that you're going to come through regardless. Um, and on the other hand, it doesn't matter because you've, because you've stepped in so far that there's not, it's not about the ego anymore it's not about oh look i'm going to do this like sense it'll trick over here and be myself and try to you know impress impress it's not me being impressive anymore it's um it's me being so deep into the text and into the work and into the voice of that author that that, that they're kind of inseparable i, I see. think see what do you think of that Rhonda? do, do, oh. do i try not to um you know in the, my initial uh my initial forays into translation, I would sometimes want to add a little bit of humor where I felt there was a bit, you have to pull back on that impulse pretty quickly. But one thing that I did find when I would read reviews of books that I had translated, um, there, this, the word poetic came up a couple of times. And as a writer uh, myself, I, I don't feel I have any kind of poetic voice. But then it came up with another author and then with another author. And I thought, well, what is going on here? Because they are, you know, a couple of them I would have identified as poetic, but not necessarily um, overall. But then I thought maybe what was happening is that there was a slight artifact of the French in the way that if the French text can create waves sometimes that maybe English doesn't as much. And I think that maybe some of that was coming through into the English translation. So it was an artifact of the French that they're identif identifying in the English that I was suddenly confused. I was like, is that my voice? But I don't think it is. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm taking notes of expressions I'm hearing tonight that I find absolutely marvelous, like like French create waves on the page. Yeah. Uh, I like that. Yeah. <laughs> Contracting out empathy. I, I really like that one. Thank you, perhaps, yeah. And uh, being a sponge for empathy. That's, that's another precious one. Um, there's another question here by, uh, oops, sorry. Oops. From Laser Later Handler, um, since the inception of Canada's annual premier literary prize for fiction, uh, only in 1994, only 11 translations have been shortlisted or longlisted, including two translations on the 2006 shortlist. Of those 11 translations, four were by Sheila Fishman and three were by Don Winkler. No translation has ever won the prize. Your thoughts? I don't know. Peter? <laughs> My thoughts? 
I think what's great about the prize is it judges the book on its own merits. It's not, and even some prizes that are in theory judge the translation. I'm not sure in how far they actually sit down and compare the French against English line by line and say, I like what he did there, or this was a good translation device used here. So I think the Giller Prize, the Scotiabank Giller Prize, makes a brilliant job of saying, this is La Fiancée Americaine, which is now Songs for the Cold of Heart. And we like the characters, we like the emotion, we like the effect the book had on us. And a good translation is going to get you to the final of a major literary prize because the book in English remains a major, important, well-written literary work and you don't lose too much along the way. I see. Uh, anyone else would like to comment on this, on this question? Good. But I do think that it's, it is saying that the translation itself is a work of art. Um, I've been thrilled to see translations on the Giller shortlist and laser I didn't realize that none had won <laughs> over the years, but um, it, it does show that the original English was an important work of art, but to me it also shows that the French translate or the, the original French was, but that the English translation is equally a work of art. I see. Thank you. Um, a question from uh, Rosemary Holy. I'm pondering, pondering the feelings, talents, purpose, purposes an author might have for her or his work, which could be kept from having a nomination, let alone winning recognition or a prize such as the Giller. Are translators editors the first trial race for an author like the Olympics? I, I often ask myself this question. <laughs> The question is, are translators and editors the first trial race for an author like the Olympics? That means that uh, uh, is the fact that you're being translated, I guess that's what the question is, is uh, the fact that you have been translated just a first sign that your book is good? I guess that would, I, am I oversimplifying the question? I don't, I don't I mean, I don't, I don't think it's a pyramid. I don't think it's a, it's a, it's a good question. I think there's definitely a, a gatekeeping that takes place. There's definitely a sense of triage, um, but there's also heaps of excellent books that are never translated. Um, and there's, there's so many reasons why something is translated. There's so many reasons why an editorial calendar is developed in a certain way by the publisher, by the editors. Um, there's so many reasons why a translator might say yes or no to a book of, and reasons that are often, you know, that can be really banal. Um, like the book. And then, the book has 250,000 words. Nobody wants to take or it. Or whatever. Out. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Oh. Um, and so it might, and so in, you know, it might have seen the light of day under more experimental guise for a variety of reasons in the original language, but there's heaps of reasons why it might never have, you know, have made it to the, have made it to the, the translation board, let's, to the table, let's say, in that regard. Um, and then prizes on top of that have so many other levels of, of arbitrariness and of personal taste and of timing and of all of those, all of the, the variables that play into that, you know, why one year and not another? Why? why one judge and not another one you know it's such a it's such it's so fraught and so and so windy in terms of a as a meritocracy and it's fine i'm glad you know i'm glad we have it because it gets more people to read ultimately which is the which is the idea which is the goal yeah well that that uh, this is really an important question because it, it 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 just shows um how i mean just as you said kat said the reasons why a book gets or doesn't get translated are not necessarily what people think you know, they, they, uh, it's, it's not a, an exercise in triage. I personally have a question for, uh, for you all. Um, it's a very simple and, and, and uh, almost uh, primitive question. Are there translators out there whose work you admire, uh, who, who have been sorts of uh, lighthouses for you or, or guiding lights for your work um, as translators? You have, you know, is, 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 is there someone that who, who uh, a literary translator where you, you, you saw somebody who, who worked like you would like to work? I think I, when we saw the, sorry, go ahead. Here, sorry. No, no, you, you go ahead, Peter. I think when we saw the uh, excerpts earlier on, well, I know I, we, we probably all did, but I was thinking, oh, I should put this bit here in my bit and that would work better here. And it's kind of like you steal techniques and inspiration and global approaches from, from others. And when I started out, I spent a lot of time like reading books in translation, like reading page for page, line by line, 
what sheet of fish might have done with such and such a thing. And I even took notes, like, you know, how different translators translate Seja, like laser letter handler translates it as junior college, which I've now stolen and used and things like that. So I think it helps to like read around, like, like with any profession, it helps to read around your subject and see what others are doing. But like with any profession too, I get the, I don't think any plumbers think other plumbers are great plumbers or admire the work of other plumbers. We all tend to be kind of things that are like, we're, we're artists, like we know what we're doing. And <laughs> but I think in a way, restricting yourself, like staying in your lane, staying in the area where you're comfortable and where you feel you're doing a good job, it's where the magic happens. Like it, it helps when you're passionate about your author and especially for your author likes what you're doing with, with the work. I think that's, that's the best you can hope for. You know, I could st start translating any author tomorrow. And if he doesn't like my work, like I might as well stop after a page. It's never going to work. You know, we're never going to revise enough kinks out of it to we get to a stage where we're both happy with it. And if he's not happy with the work, well, what's the point? Like, you know, I'm translating his words and trying to make a success of them in English. Like we're trying to win the Giller Prize in English. And if he feels I'm betraying his intentions or I'm not making a good job of bringing his words across in English, well, we may as well pack up and go home. I see. And sorry, second important bit to that is there's a million other translators who are better suited to that particular book than I am. So let them have a go. Somebody else is going to take, a, take the book and run with it and make a great job of it and, and fair play to them. So. At QC Fiction, I see both sides because I'm a fiction editor and I translate a few of our books. And I spend a lot of time as fiction editor. I spend a lot of time reading, trying to find a book that I think works with our collection. But then I spend a really long time trying to find the right translator that I think will love the book and will make a, a nice job of the translation. And it, there's a nice synergy with the author and we're all literally on the same page and just to get to get the extra 10%, you know, to get the extra magic that happens when everyone's really rolling in the same direction, and everyone's passionate about the project, not just this is a good book and I like it and it's a long enough project and I happen to be free for the next six months, but yeah. really, you know, I remember reading La Fiancée Américaine and I just had a daughter and I wasn't sleeping. And I remember thinking, if I have to get out at four o'clock in the morning, every morning and translate this book, that's what I'm going to do. Like, I want to translate this book. I think <laughs> ideally, like fair enough, you know, we don't knock every press release out of the park and we don't knock every book out of the park, but I think ideally you have a great book in French and a translator who loves the book in English and makes a good job on it and works hard with the, with the author and works hard with the reviser and with the proofreaders and with the English language publisher. And a lot of work goes into it until you, you end up with a nice product. Thank you, Peter. Rhonda, did you want to say something about your idols of the translation world? Oh, I was just going to say, well, first of all, I'm sorry I'm losing the light because I, I forgot it was August and an overhead light just went out. So hopefully I won't completely fade away in the next four minutes. But I have a hard time reading other people's translations. Like when you put those four excerpts up, I was just, you know, a wash in shame of all the things I could have done and all the things I missed. So I dose that very carefully because uh, I've just, I'm a little, I, I guess, too shaky in my, my own abilities to, to, to take big chunks of other people's work. But I was saying to Susan before, um, before we started, I, I was at BAMP uh, for the build seat when Susan was the program director and I'd gone to see her with a question and this is where she told me, you know, that she comes from the words in French and goes to a place with no words and then comes back to words in English. And I walked around with that for years, trying to figure out how does that happen? And it's only now that I start to feel that, uh, so, you know, sort of settle in to me. But for years I spent going, how does she do that? <laughs> Thank you very much, Rhonda. So this is uh, this brings us to the end of our uh, meeting. It went really fast. Uh, I feel that I'm privileged. Uh, I feel privileged that I had the opportunity to talk to you this summer to meet you all, uh, Suzanne, Katia, Rhonda, and Peter. Uh, thank you very much for uh, coming into my office <laughs> tonight. Thank you. Thank you uh, to the uh, Scotia Bangalore Prize Foundation for uh, this invitation. Um, I'm very sorry about the questions we didn't have time to answer, and I wish you a very nice month of August and uh, talk to you soon, I hope.
Goodbye. Thank you all so much for an incredible conversation. It was eye-opening, it was instructive. Um, I love the translation and the translation experiment, Eric. I thought it was a terrific idea and how engaged everyone was. Uh, the notion, you know, the notion of empathy and, and subtext and uh, intentionality and everything that you guys discussed, I think just is, is a, is a mirror to, to how much you guys are after the truth of a text and that comes through. So I, I so appreciate your time and talent tonight and your energy. Uh, I wanna say to all our viewers that the video of tonight's event will be up in the coming days on our website, on YouTube and on Facebook. So please check it out. Um, as I said, tonight was our last master panel but please do check back in uh, January to see what we have in store for you. Thanks again to all the viewers, to all our participants. Good night.